Okay, so welcome to Retech, and today we're just going to do our retro review. It's been a few weeks longer than I was going to do, but um, I've done quite a lot this month, as you probably kind of realised. Um, there's been a lot of videos that I've put out, and some of them kind of um, gain a few comments, which I always like comments because they're great, whether they're kind of for or against, or to say that, you know, you should have looked at this, or you could have looked at that, and how about this? This is all good. Um, but one of them was for the Acorn Electron, and the video I did about not so much the repair side of it and cleaning it up, it was about the new acquisition that I got, the new machine, where I um, kind of went through the detailing of the box etc and I quite wanted to do a bit of tongue in cheek on that one because everything from the 1980s is very weird. Um, it is now anyway for our kind of 21st century sensibilities and it's nice to have a look at them with a bit of tongue-in-cheek because you got to remember that in the 1980s everything was serious. Everything that they put on box art was meant to be serious. Everything that they did, built, designed was meant to be serious. And nowadays um, you can kind of look back at it with a little bit of tongue-in-cheekness and it, see some of it to be kind of the folly it really was. And, you know, I'm not saying that the Acorn Electron was a folly, but... Um, it's kind of weird on its interpretation of the box art where you, you, you can only conclude that they must have thought really that the kind of current situation with the Electron and the 8-bit micros at the time that the Electron was a slight bit of a folly because um, the, the theory and the general consensus at ACOM was the fact that the Electron was a bit of a step backwards. Um, you know, maybe that was the case, maybe it wasn't. Um, maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but it was just a bit of fun, and that's what it's all about. You've got to have a little bit of fun sometimes and not take life and these things too seriously. Um, because it... <laughs> Because at the moment, let's be honest, um, life's very serious at the moment with what's going on in the world and we need to kind of escape from it and that's what this stuff is all about and this is what your retro equipment, whether it's computers, whether it's cameras, whether it's train sets and toys and collecting cars, whether it's collecting coffee makers or whatever kind of you really get into because it gives you that retro kick and that nostalgic kick, that's perfectly fine because everybody needs to find their kind of quiet spot there, the kind of relaxed and nice place, which is good. But at the end of the day, there are so many disenchanted, disaffected people in the world that you know, everyone needs to have their own little spot. And that's what this is all about. And um, I hope um, you've kind of come along for the ride. So I'm just going to cover a few things, plus my um, kind of slight obsession with the cameras this month. Um, it kind of became a bit of a, uh, not an obsession so much, but a bit of a mission. I was on a mission, um, a mission to try and find something that was better than what I've got and that kind of proved slightly fruitless I mean I'm filming this on a, a Nikon okay and um, it's a really good SLR so is my Sony which I, is my preferred make mainly because of the ethos behind the brand and you know usual kind of personal reasons but the Nikon camera and most di uh, digital SLR cameras are very very good now they're, they're they're incredibly fantastic machines and um, this is being filmed at about 50 frames per second in high def and so on so it's, it's very good quality but I have a little bit of a, an issue with they don't seem to match up from professional and semi-professional cameras from even a decade ago and it's a shame because I think what they're trying to do with digital SLR cameras is make them into the all-rounder cameras, the all-singing, all-dancing cameras, and trying to pack them into smaller and smaller bodies. Uh, and they're also going to mirrorless, and they're also packing them into smaller and smaller sensors, not quite as small as your phone. 
they're never going to be as kind of crude quality really as your phone sensor is. doesn't matter how many megapixel your phone's reported to have. But um, they aren't all-rounders. I mean, you know, they are for general video and photographs, obviously. They're, they're second to none. Any digital SLR camera is wet way way better than a mobile phone simply because they've got larger sensors so anyway so i'm kind of rambling into cameras here but basically these are my preferred cameras um they're both sony's i have four of the various models on these we have um these are just two of them but basically these are the two that i use the most often now back in Oh, must be a decade old or so these cameras were about four thousand pounds okay so not cheap by any stretch of the imagination now this is the one i use possibly the most and the reason for that is because i've kind of modified it over the years as well and it's become a personal bit of kit and what you find is the the low light performance of these cameras is far superior to modern digital cameras, mirrorless or not. Um, and also the, the things you can do with them, you know, the, the amount of different options you have on microphones and altering the gain and basically tuning the mic and the sound to the way you want it. And also tuning the color and the picture to the way you want it, using different lenses, having a proper non-digital zoom. It's a proper optical zoom, really does make a difference. Um, but they are big and they are bulky and they're, for a reason they are big and bulky is because they do possibly a lot more than a standard phone or a standard DSLR. And this one has also got a secondary digital pack on here, but it's basically quick editing, you know, so you've got your standard kind of digital format in this camera then I have a secondary one on the side which is great because it uses kind of relatively or really cheap and cheap SD cards and you know you can carry a pocket full of them around and just pop them in as you need them so yeah it becomes a bit more of an advantage but at the end of the day um, it can have multiple attachments on it you can attach anything you like to this camera mainly because of its size and I find these cameras much more enjoyable to use than the kind of relatively modern stuff and more much more better than a, a phone because I started off on a phone and they're auto focusing and you know the way they react to changes like doing this you might even see it on here where it kind of tries to grab the focus um, isn't as quick isn't as good as it is something with a huge lens on it and huge sensors and that's the same as this okay we have this Sony camera here 3 CCD it's um, XLR based it will do anything and everything that you want to do it off the camera itself from microphone gain to basically anything you really want to whether you want it in night shot if you want it in night vision if you want it you know everything you want to do really to be honest and this one's a lot smaller to carry around but it has a good feature set on it so this is the one i, I kind of use a lot and i've also got a, a, a much smaller camera which again is a Sony, which again is under the same range as this, and it's another semi-professional camera, but it's, it's about this big, and you may have seen, may or may not have seen it previously, and all of these cameras, all four of these that I own, um, have given me not a single bit of problem, single bit of bother in all of the time that I've owned them, and plus the battery life on them is 10 plus hours of continuous filming, of just filming it and you just quickly pop the battery off the quick release at the back and pop another one on i've got probably half a dozen batteries so you know things like that is so convenient um so yeah um i've been struggling with trying to find something to replace these with i may not yet i may just soldier on with these because they're do what they want to do so anyway that's the camera bit over and done with so if you're wondering why every now and again there's different 
kind of color saturation slightly different sound quality and so on this is because i've been slightly experimenting just a little bit right so basically on to the videos as well okay so this this month we've done quite a few videos it's kind of i'm just going down the list there's been that many um We've done a couple of three minute retro videos. I've slowed down on those for a reason, as I said, because I kind of wanted to get the line out so it builds up a little portfolio so people can click through them and, you know, get a, a quick retro fix if they're looking for something that they need to learn about or know about very, very quickly. So that was the idea of those. There will be a few more. I did a chatting with the BBC Micro um, and again, that one was just basically about the sound and how it's formed its sound and how much useful it was for a BBC or any computer to be able to talk to you and how much of a big deal that was back in the early 1980s. Um, then I've done a couple of laptops. One of them was a, a netbook um, because they've forgotten about. I mean, who nowadays really remembers or uses a netbook? The closest thing we have now are Chromebooks, which really are netbooks, but you know, the they've got a bigger feature set, a little bit more powerful and so on and they've they took over the reins of the netbook as well as tablets such as this thing here okay so um and i believe they're going to be future classics and um, they're already kind of getting there because of the age of some of them but you know it's it's going to be nice to see where they head in a few years time because that if you do a search on ebay and find my retro and all that kind of stuff you find there are few and far between even now um the amstrad 50 uh the amstrad 512 the ppc the portable version got very good views i was really happy with that because i kind of thought that that kind of machine wasn't massively interesting because it was a kind of a little bit of a cynical repackage of one of these and um, you know I kind of thought that it was tend to have been aimed at business markets and so on so very few people outside of maybe UK and Europe would have remembered those or had an inkling to what they were all about but again vintage classic it's nostalgia and that's what it's all about um, so I did a couple of runs on laptops. Future Retro is the IBM X60. Now that's a machine that I didn't think was as old as it was because the X60 and 61s I've been using and kids have been playing with them and they've been used to standby laptops because they're still suitable to browse the internet. They're still suitable to do most, if not all of your kind of basic stuff on including word processing etc so um yeah they're relatively young in retro terms but they're heading that way they're, they're kind of getting to 15 16 17 years old some of them now then we've did a, a quick video on my zx spectrums you see you probably know that i've got a few machines a few spectrums and it's rotating them and keeping on top of them is getting to be a bit of a an almost full-time issue to get them out charge them make sure they're working check them over make sure there's no issues with them and then repair anything that there is you know failing capacitors failing anything really from ribbon cables to tracks lifting off circuit boards to failing membranes and so on and um, it was a bit of a shock when i pulled one out that I hadn't used for a while and it just wouldn't power on and I immediately thought there was an issue but so I turned it off to grab another one to do some filming with and um, I found out that it was very slow on powering on so the kind of the penny dropped really it was the case of it hasn't been used long and the capacitors were for want of a better term were empty so they needed um, a bit of power in them to bring them back to life and that took longer than you would have expected so you know all of these minor things are things that you're going to come across if you kind of have your own collection of retro machines or even if you only have one and it's your pride and joy and then one day you find that it doesn't turn on so it's worth checking um, then i did a little bit on the acorn as i said before um, and I titled it the Acorn from the Cowboy Years and one of the biggest things for that is, is because it was a term I used in that video basically at the time through the early 1980s it was the Cowboy Years of the microcomputer because it was new 
and everybody was trying to make a buck, trying to make their way, trying to make some money, trying to get their products out, trying to beat their competitors and especially in Cambridge where their competitors were many within literally walking distance of each other there were so many different micro manufacturers that it was just insane really that anyone thought that they were going to kind of survive long term and it was also insane that there was enough of a market even throughout the entire population of Europe and the UK put together for all of these disparate and different microcomputers. So yeah, that was really what that was all about. Um, then obviously I did the Electron and the Dystopian Future, which was a bit of tongue in cheek, bit of a laugh. So that was what it was aimed at. So I hope it was seen that way. And um, it was nice to get hold of a boxed, almost perfect Acorn Electron. Um, many, many of those were bought as Christmas presents and the children they were bought for were slightly disappointed, a lot of them, because they really wanted a BBC Micro. But, you know, um, that's how it was. You know, the BBC Micro was so, so expensive back in that time period. And then Toshiba laptops, the almost £4,000 laptop or $4,000 laptop um, back in the, the late 90s. And um, it's kind of nice to see how we've come on and kind of nice really to see how much Toshiba is viewed differently nowadays. It's no longer viewed as the kind of company that's striving to be the best, striving to innovate, striving to, you know, create some of the best products in the world. Um, they're kind of run of the mill, which is a shame because there was a lot a lot of good people and a lot of innovation at Toshiba at the time as there was in a lot of companies around that era um, but as things become mainstream things become cheaper things become more kind of cost consumer focused you know the kind of innovation dies off a little bit and the quality dies off a little bit along with it um, we've also done Jetpack, uh, game on Jetpack. It was, it was kind of a, a small video about Jetpack and the company surrounding it more than the game itself. And um, you know, it's quite interesting to look at how these companies were founded and if they're still around today. And Ultimate Play the Game has morphed along the way, but it's still kind of surviving, but not in its original form. And now it's part of the Microsoft empire really so yeah it's um nice to see something like that evolve and it's also nice to see one of the probably one of the nicest created games in terms of quality in terms of the way it was put together kind of being put out there again for people to go and try and enjoy on a range of different platforms and you know if you haven't got a micro and you're into them and you want to see what it's all about get an emulator stick it on your pc or your tablet and have a go because you know you'll get a very similar experience of the actual software even if you don't have the actual hardware you know obviously it's nicer to get the experience of the hardware but we can't have every micro we can't have every platform so again this is where emulators really shine it gives you the chance to see what it was all about so that's good so yeah so that's where we are um over the last month or so i've also popped on a um one of the little youtube kind of thank you boxes kind of thing membership boxes now um we like most people um you know we work full time we will have other jobs we do this as a hobby and um you know it, and we know very few of us are looking for making a kind of career out of it because we know it's a bit of fun and we hope that other people enjoy it and that's what this is all about and i think most people don't realize is that you know doing these kind of videos it kind of gets a bit expensive it's a hobby yes which um quite happy with in fact it's it's kind of a place where I like to kind of disappear into just to, to 
play with these machines and bring them back to life or repair them or fix them and or whatever I need to do with them and it's it's quite nice just to chill with them every now and again but you know I have bought equipment for video so I've bought individual machines just to make a video about I bought components I bought parts you know you name it and you know I'm not saying that you know it should be funded because I'm not but if you know you like these videos and you think you know what I think I might support this person or this channel and so on then if you do decide to do that and click in the little box and then um, I will be grateful because you know I don't expect it and that's the biggest thing all I want to do is to build a kind of portfolio of these machines what they did and so on what the software did and all of the stuff that time seems to be forgetting about even though really in relative terms this kind of IT computer micro kind of industry is very very short it's very small it's um you know it's a very small part of humanity but it's become a very important one and that's what i'm doing all of this for so you know um at the end of the day if you want to support me brilliant i'll put your name up and thank you and all you know and i'll, I'll do my best to um make sure that you know people are aware that you know you've decided to support me unless you don't want me to because you know not everybody does and um, it would be nice to be able to put it towards something else for the channel or a bit of equipment something that i might be missing and so on and that's all it will be used for i'm not in it there's a lot of people here on youtube and who do these type of videos and not in it to make a living or to make money so you know i think once you start going down that route of wanting to make your money out of this i think things get a bit stayed at the moment i can virtually do whatever i want really as far as content's concerned i can kind of twist it around things but um because i'm not making a living at it i don't have to stick to one particular route so which is nice it's nice for you guys because you see a lot of other things that you wouldn't normally see and also the music the the music i like to do my own and i will be doing more when i get a little bit of times probably the last few videos have had a similar outro etc then you know they have over the past maybe five six weeks or so and i do like to change bits of music now and again which is why i put a little video of the retro music out there it's, if you want to use it or use bits of it you're more than welcome to use snippets of video you know just put courtesy of you know myself here and I, I, that, that's it done if you want to use it in your videos i don't mind that's what it's there for that's prob well that's probably no it's not probably that's the main reason i put that video out anyway just you know as a kind of um use it if you want and that's what it's there for so yeah you're welcome to use bits and pieces of it in your own stuff if you decide to go down that route a lot of you might think no no more please um because you know it might not be your taste your style and so on and you know i don't profess to be a professional musician i enjoy it just like a lot of other people do and uh, again to me it's a bit of fun and it's a bit of a release and it also keeps the copyright people out of your hair if you know what i mean as well so yeah yeah use it if you want cut bits out of it download it put put it in videos etc that's fine by me okay so yeah um but these videos do take a lot of time um a lot of time that you know people may or may not realize i mean this one's taking longer than it should do because i'm still trying out dslrs if i'd used one of these or one of these with a 10 hour rolling time um i'd have probably just got straight through it you know quickly had a kind of rough idea of what i was going to say and then go straight through it but as i have this has been my third attempt on this because of the battery life on these dslrs plus also the limitations of the video and all this kind of thing and now i'm not rubbing dslrs the wrong way because i think they're fantastic i use them a lot for snippets close-ups and general photography i i actually that's why i have them you know um but you know there is a time when you buy a certain thing to do a certain job 
and not everything's the Swiss Army knife of all things, whether it's cameras and computers and whatever you are into. So yeah, um, yeah, they do take a bit of time. Some videos take hours, well, 10, 11 hours, 12 hours. One of my favorite videos of basically linking up all of the tech within Cambridge. Um, and I did a kind of a ride around Cambridge and I basically pointed out where different places were and all this kind of thing. Took me quite a while. That one took me an entire day to put right and get across what I wanted to do. Um, others, such as the educational ones, um, they they took me a long time because I had to refresh my memory on, you know, certain inventors and certain people from the past. You know, the Nick, the um, the kind of normal ones that most people realize um, the Turings and etc of this world were relatively straightforward because it's something I've been reading about and dealing with for quite some time and uh, it's something that I used to learn about Babbage and Turing etc in computer studies way back when the BBC and the Video Genie were the current machine. So yeah, that's been, that was fairly easy because that just came out of my past kind of learning, but others I've had to kind of research and learn about. I knew the framework, but I didn't know the details. So yeah, sometimes it takes a lot. Um, for most of my videos, including the educational ones and the history ones, I don't put a script down. Um, I don't really see the need to. Um, I have a framework which I pop into my head and I will, if I'm not sure of anything, I'll quickly read up on something and, and I'll memorize whatever I've read and um, put it into context as best I can. But I kind of, I'm not the keenest on kind of verbatim reading from a script. Uh, for me, it always sounds not brilliant. It always sounds a little bit false. Um, but then again, I think everybody who reads from something always thinks that their own kind of voice is a little bit false when they hear it back. But I'd rather it just came out and mistakes and all. And um, I'll be the first one to admit when I've made mistakes. Um, because we all do, um, or mispronounce something, or try to pronounce something, as in one of my videos um, that's just been released, and I'm not very good at it, but you know, I just put a little disclaimer, because I do try, so um, yeah, I'd rather it was live, I'd rather there were as few edits as possible within the video, because it makes it nicer for people to listen to, that's what I think, and I believe, I could be wrong, but you know, that's what I'm doing. So yeah. So anyway, these um, videos are a hobby. These videos are also a mission for my little ones because they wanted to learn about this stuff and they've also got involved in it, which is fantastic. So yeah. So yeah, the next thing I want to cover is the cost of things. The cost of everything is spiraling, especially retro stuff. Um, whether it's computers, cameras, I mean anything really, any electronics, anything that brings back nostalgia, toys, etc. And they, they, the kind of costs are spiraling out of the hobbyist and the enthusiast's kind of pockets, which I think is a real shame. I mean, for example, if we take um, a couple of computers, Okay, so if you missed that bit, because um, I'm using a DSLR and it's got a 13 minute single frame or single video limit on it and it's just gone, nope, time up. But anyway, I was talking about the Plus 4 and basically, um, yeah, it's a machine that nobody wanted along with the um, Commodore 16, etc. And they've skyrocketed in price along with the Amiga 1200s and so on. Even these things, you know, the early PCs have just gone through the roof. It's just nuts. But I think everything seems to have. I think technology's got to a point where it's been so good over maybe the last decade or so that even these kind of older video cameras, which I find is absolutely fantastic, the prices of these have started to go through the roof now as well. So if you want to replace one because you know you just need another one or whatever, 
you you suddenly find that prices are rising and it, it's um yeah it's i don't know if it's sustainable but maybe it's the fact that a lot of technologies hit a kind of a plateau and again with video cameras really do you need 30 megapixels on a on a camera really to do video uh, not really do you need it in photographs not really um you know most kind of professional photographers have been staying for quite a while that really six seven eight nine megapixels is more than adequate for anyone really to be honest so yeah i think we've kind of hit a plateau once the everything got good quality and you couldn't tell the difference between a photograph taken on a, a dslr or a you know a digital camera to a photograph taken on a, a normal film camera then you know that's when things plateau and that's when things are you know really not gonna get optically for your eyes any better it's the same as 8k tvs really can you tell the difference once they stop rolling their once they stop rolling their um, demos in shops and you get at home and you watch tv and you go yeah really doesn't look a lot of difference 8k 4k 2k really roughly um people are kind of getting a little bit weary of jumps for the sake of it instead of jumps for a definite meaning but anyway i i hope you enjoyed this so please subscribe and um i hope you will come along with me on a little bit more journey for this and if you want to tick the little um basket down the bottom and help me kind of fund a little bit of this um then i'll be eternally grateful so thank you thanks for your time thanks for listening to my waffle and i'll see you soon see you bye bye